Let's just see who's in the room. I know there is some business people, there are some policymakers. Just to put a fine point on what Thomas was saying, is there anyone here who has all the money they need for what they're trying to accomplish? By a show of hands. Okay. Then we're all on the same page, and we potentially what I have to share with you can be helpful. So what I've called today's talk is Unlock Community Capital, How to Tap Local Investment for Community Development. And I want to share a lot of stuff that we've been doing in North America, primarily in the US, but also some in Canada, because I think it could be inspiring to you about things that you might do here. There's three topics that I want to run through in the next 35 minutes or so. One is, why should you invest local? Why, why should we even be talking about this? Second, what is a local investment? It's a lot more than you think it is. And number three, what are some specific activities you can undertake to implement this? So let's first talk about why sh you should invest local. Let's begin with some key facts that are true about both the US economy and the Australian economy. The first is that we know from a mountain of evidence that locally owned businesses are key for economic development. They're key for innovation. We know in the US that communities with a high density of locally owned business have the highest per capita job growth rate and the highest per capita income growth rate. So in other words, you want to bring down poverty, raise social equality, locally owned businesses are key for this. And we know they're good for the environment, they're good for tourism, they're good for entrepreneurship. I think no one will disagree with that point. Second point, most of the jobs in your economy and our economy are in locally owned business. In the United States, it's 60 to 80 percent of our jobs, depending on how you define local. In Australia, countrywide, it's probably around 70 to 80 percent. So you are a more local business country than we are. Last point, locally owned businesses are remarkably profitable. Now, I don't have really recent data to show you this because it's hard to find data on, but the Canadian government, Canada's not a wildly dissimilar country, the Canadian government did this analysis in 2009 and found that the highest profit rates are with firms with 10 to 20 employees. The least profit rates were in firms with under with over 500 employees, that is, firms that might be traded on the Toronto Stock Exchange. So given these basic facts, I am guessing that all of you being smart investors are investing like crazy in local businesses to take advantage of those high profit rates. So let's check it out. Those of you with superannuation funds, which is, I think, all of you, how many of you put at least 1% in locally owned business? OK. Now, this suggests a problem. And it's a problem that affects everything that the city of Newcastle is trying to accomplish. We are systematically over-investing in publicly traded global companies that have no connection to our community, and we don't know, we don't trust, and then we're surprised when something goes wrong with them. And we're under-investing, not investing at all, in local businesses that we know are critically important for our own vitality. Here's, here's the reason for this. Back in the 1930s and 1940s, your country and mine created securities law. And securities law can be understood as a system of legal apartheid. 
Basically, if you're Gordon Gecko in the top couple of percentage points in income and wealth, you're allowed to invest in anything, anytime, no questions asked. If you're the rest of the country, you are considered a non-accredited investor, and you can only put a penny in a locally owned business if that business historically has done fifteen, twenty-five, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 of legal work. No local business in their right mind thinks that's a good equation. And so that's why we've evolved an entire system of institutions around big global companies and left the 70, 80 percent of our economy behind. The really good news is that if we can fix this capital market failure, you can bring an incredible amount of money into your community and for your businesses and for your municipal projects. <coughs> there is about three and a half trillion dollars in Australian super fund uh, accounts right now, countrywide. Let's just assume that uh, locally owned businesses are 70% of your economy. I'm going to be very conservative here. So 70% of that three and a half trillion is what belongs in the local sector. We divide that by 25-ish million people living in Australia, and it's $90,000 per capita. That is the payoff of getting a local ecosystem right. And for the city of Newcastle, by your population, that would be 41 billion extra dollars to invest in stuff. I think that's a quest worth going on. You don't need perfection in order to get some good stuff out of this. So this is a study that I did in Cleveland, Ohio in 2010, two other people. It's called the 25% shift. And we looked at the impact of residents of Cleveland, Ohio shifting 25% of their spending from non-local food to local food. Just that one change in behavior creates 27,000 new jobs, paying $868 million, and generating $126 million in new state and local taxes. Now, you would require some serious investment in locally owned food businesses, startups, or expansions to get to the 25% shift. So we estimated that would be about three quarters of a billion dollars. So three quarters of a billion dollars is this gigantic red line here. It is 1% of what Clevelanders have in their bank accounts, and one quarter of 1% of what Clevelanders have in their pension funds. So even a very tiny shift in Cleveland of people's investment behavior of less than 1% could create tens of thousands of jobs. That is the significance of what we're talking about here. More good news. 2012, this guy, this forgotten president, signed something called the Jobs Act, which legalized investment crowdfunding and made local investment more affordable and accessible. <coughs> Excuse me. I took this picture off of my iPhone. It was the first and the only time that I have been in the Rose Garden. Uh, and the Jobs Act really had a very simple set of rules with it. Any US company could raise up to a million dollars if it went to a federally licensed website called a portal. Any American could put as much as $2,200 per year into these businesses, more if you earn over $107,000. A couple of years after this was signed into effect, they raised the ceiling from $1 million to $5 million. So here's what, we, what has happened. 2016 was the year 
that the JOBS Act was finally implemented with the regulators' blessings. And in the six or so years since then, a million and a half Americans have invested $1.8 billion in 6,000 companies. The average successful investment crowdfunding company has raised $400,000. The average investor has put into crowdfunding about $800. The most successful entrepreneurs have been women and people of color because they were the ones who were most systematically excluded from the conventional capital marketplace by venture funds and big banks and hedge funds and so forth. But altogether, this has meant a quarter of a million new jobs for the United States. It is not a trivial development in our economy. So let's take a step back and ask a more fundamental question. So what is local investment? Yes, it is investing in local business, but it's a lot more than that. And I underscore it's a lot more than that because people relate to the investment system in very different ways depending upon their personal financial situation. So let me give you 12 examples of local investment. One investment would be an investment in yourself. So one of the ways that in the United States communities are losing enormous amounts of capital is through credit cards. Because people are paying on their credit cards 25 to 30% interest plus penalties, and it's going out of the community to somewhere else. So to put a dollar into your retirement when you're deeply in credit card debt is a total nutty situation. Your rate of return could be gigantic if you put that money into getting out of credit card debt. And what's good for the goose is good for the gander. It's good for your children. Also in the United States, we have millions of children, including my kids, who have student loan debt. And the student loan debt is at, I don't know, eight, nine percent right now. And parents could swoop in and invest and take their kids off the debt and then the kids would pay the parents back. Now, granted, that introduces some fraught elements in the relationship, but maybe this is a way of teaching people some financial discipline. Number three, your home. For about a third of the people in the United States, the only wealth they will ever have when they go into retirement will be their home. So getting this investment uh, in, in alignment is, is really important. We know that in most circumstances in the United States, and I bet the same thing is true in Australia, because of our crazy tax laws, investing in a home almost always generates a better return than Wall Street or the public markets. Why? With our um, particular investing system, at the end of your pension fund, you take out money, you pay taxes. In contrast, at the end of owning your home, you sell it and you get an enormous amount of capital gains tax-free. Another thing is the mortgage interest deduction, which we have and you have a variation of. These tax laws mean that even if your house doesn't appreciate a penny, this is still a very good rate of return. So suppose you have a home. Well, then it probably makes sense if you have extra money to pay down your mortgage faster because your rate of return will be really good from that. And then if you've paid off all of your home stuff, there's a bunch of other places you might look in order to make personal investments. So my most recent successful investment has been in household solar. About a year ago, my wife and I moved to Palm Springs, California in Palm Springs, between May and September, the typical peak temperature is between 115 and 120 Fahrenheit. Um, so it's pretty hot there. 
And we were really pretty stunned in August that our electricity bill from air conditioning was $700. That was the impetus to put solar on the roof. We borrowed money out of our pension fund, and I'll explain later how that's done, and we did the deed. We put solar on the roof, brought our electricity costs basically down to zero, and we're getting a payback on that that in financial terms is double digits. Okay, so I mentioned the first five here because I think for many people in our economy, just getting these basic finance decisions right is critical for them and critical for local investment. And, and thinking about this then, how do you get a lot of people living in Newcastle to rethink their finances? That then becomes an important municipal objective. Now we start moving into the more conventional space of our putting money into other businesses. Historically, one of the places where local investment occurred most frequently was in co-ops. So this is Weaver Street Market a grocery co-op and research triangle in North Carolina. They needed to build another store. How did they do it? They borrowed money from their members and paid their members back at very attractive interest rates, better than Wall Street, and that's how they got their capital together. This happens all the time. Businesses, we'll talk more about that. Nonprofits. In the, in the United States, nonprofits can also do investment crowdfunding. Now, they can't take equity, but they can borrow from people. They can do loans. And one of the coolest forms of nonprofit uh, involvement in crowdfunding is getting their fans and other people to buy their buildings. So people who say might love... Um, I don't know, the, 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 the Salvation Army. They help them buy the building and someone gets a couple of bricks worth. And you know from nonprofits, a huge portion of what nonprofits have to spend their money on is rent. So getting them in an ownership situation actually is one of the best things you can do for a nonprofit success. Real estate, there's been a trend, a discernible trend in U.S. crowdfunding of people shifting from investing exclusively in businesses to now investing in real estate development projects. And we have a couple of websites, Small Change being one of them, that focus on real estate oriented projects. Investment in municipal bonds. So a couple of years ago there was a website around called Neighborly that worked in the space of helping cities sell their municipal bonds at a low issue to grassroots investors, which was really wonderful because as a city and you need more capital, not everyone wants you to raise taxes, but maybe you can raise some of that capital through bonds. Now this website no longer exists, complex set of reasons, but this idea is happening in other ways that I will share in a few minutes. Number 11 is a community fund. So there are 10,000 funds in the United States. About 30 of them are focused on local businesses and allow grassroots investors to participate. One of them is run by the Economic and Community Development Institute of Columbus, Ohio. They have more than a dozen revolving loan funds, and in some of those funds they allow grassroots investors to participate. And I think many people would say this is the most important financial support institution for local businesses in Columbus. Finally, it's worth mentioning a local bank or credit union. We have data in the United States that suggest that every dollar put on deposit in a local bank or credit union, the probability of that money going into a local business is three times greater than it would be if you put that dollar on deposit 
in a global bank. And that makes them hugely more important places where we park our money. Last set of points. How do we spread local investment? How do we get this started? And what I want to emphasize here about the 12 items I'm going to share with you is most of them are pretty easy to do and pretty inexpensive to do and do not depend on radical changes in securities laws. So, step number one, education. In the United States, even though we've had six years of the, of the Jobs Act, in effect, I would say that at least 99% of the public is completely unaware of this as an investment option. And same thing with the business community. 99% of the small business community is unaware of this option. So I've taught a bunch of workshops online. They usually go for four weeks at a time. Uh, I've done them in Alaska, Rhode Island, New Hampshire, uh, Washington State, Oregon, Southern California. We're just trying to get to as many people as possible to teach them how to do local investing and teach businesses how to take advantage of investment crowdfunding. But if you're interested in learning more yourself, um, this is one of my websites. It's called themainstreetjournal.org. And there's this little button here, local investing vi vi videos. Um, I've recorded 50 different short educational videos, 10 to 15 minutes long each, on almost every question I could, could think of around investment crowdfunding. Now, some of them are relevant more for US audience, but I encourage you to come in, take a look at them. It's free, and I think you'll enjoy them. Number two, unleashing lions. LION stands for the Local Investment Opportunity Network of Port Towns in Washington. Started by this guy, James Fraser, a former hedge fund manager who suddenly got conscious and he decided to return to his hometown of Port Townsend and create a monthly potluck dinner. And the idea of the potluck dinner was to bring together local businesses and local investors and introduce them to one another. There are no presentations. There are no structured interactions or offerings. That would run afoul of our securities law. But just building these relationships has led to a million dollars per year of new local investment every year since 2007 in a 10,000 person town. So you do the math about what that implies if you start doing this neighborhood by neighborhood in Newcastle. Number three, publishing a list. People need to know what are my local investment options. And then they don't have time to be Googling for an hour to find this. So one of my recommendations um, to Simon and Thomas is put a, put a page on your website related to economic development that lists all the companies in Newcastle, local businesses, that are currently raising capital. You're not doing any of the transactions. You're just letting people know these are options out there. Click, they go to the portal, and you can do the transaction. This is what a colleague and I did in Baltimore, Maryland, with something we call the Maryland Neighborhood Exchange. If you look at our website, you will see that it is a really terrible website. It was designed by my colleague's junior high school son. Um, but we had no money, and we just wanted to experiment. This little cheap experiment over two and a half years helped mm, maybe 45 African-American-led businesses in Baltimore raise $4 million from 6,000 investors. 
So just putting a place up there where local investors know where to look is really important. I want to do this in email form, so I'm developing a new part of the Main Street Journal, which Main Street Journal is this newsletter about developments, mostly in the United States, but the most recent issue and the next issue are going to be on Australia. Uh, but I communicate to my readers how they can do more local investing, and we're going to start listing local securities that are available for them. And the idea is to just push this into their inbox every other week. And that's something you might think about doing as well. Number five is organizing registered investment advisors, what we call RIAs. Now, registered investment advisors, the people we ask for investment advice and we pay dearly for that service, they are currently one of the biggest enemies of local investment because they know nothing about it and yet they pretend they know everything about it. And if you ask your local investment advisor, hey, look, I've just gotten this opportunity. Uh, my local co-op, grocery co-op, which has been around for 30 years, they're doing another store in the other side of town uh, they're trying to borrow some money to get make this possible, like the Weaver Street Market. Should I do the deal? And I guarantee you, your registered investment advisor will say, no, this is really stupid. Most local businesses fail. So this is a very common mistake. It is not true that most local businesses fail. It is true that most local business startups fail. Most large business startups fail. But that lack of a distinction between the tiny number of startups versus established businesses is a very critical mistake. And if you want to be a local investor without a high level of risk, you invest in established businesses. And the hypothetical that I gave you was a co-op that has been around with an established track record that was expanding in a very methodical way. Anyway, this woman, Angela Barbash, is a wonderful registered investment advisor. She's in Ypsilanti, Michigan. And she is organizing other registered investment advisors to help, uh, help build a kind of common knowledge base of what are available local investment opportunities. So they collectively start moving their, the people that they're advising into the right things. I think this is something you could and should do here in Newcastle. Number six, pre-selling. So let me give you an example of what pre-selling is. When COVID hit, I got alarmed about what its impact was on a lot of my favorite local businesses. So I wrote a blog that uh, got, got a little bit of attention in the United States, which was called Adopt a Local Business. Pick one business and help support that business during COVID. So the business I picked was Busboys and Poets, in, um, which is run by Andy Shalal. It's a combination bookstore, restaurant, bar, event center, wonder, and, and he has multiple busboys and poets in the Washington area where I was living then, and he employed about a thousand people. And I said, Andy, here is a thousand dollar check for myself and my wife. We don't want you to pay it back, just give me a thousand dollars of gift cards and we'll use it over time. But that thousand dollars will give you some cash right now at a time when you really need it. He was so pleased, he gave me $1,200 of gift cards. So I got a 20% rate of return on that particular investment. Pre-selling like that, where I bought a lot of eating at Andy Shalal's in advance, is, for the most part, not a security. So it is a dance around conventional securities law. And getting your businesses to do some pre-selling offerings 
without having to spend all this money on securities lawyers, even the ones working for portals, is a tremendous step forward. Because to be a successful crowd funder, you need to develop the crowd. Why not develop the crowd with pre-selling? We have a site that does this now called Credibles. Uh, that might be worth your looking at. Number seven, facilitate self-direction. So you, like we, have a problem. Most people's investment is tied up in retirement funds that have no local investment options. How do you get around this? Well, in the United States, we have two ways of doing it. We can create a self-directed IRA or a solo 401k. Solo 401k are for self-employed people like myself. And it was through our solo 401k that we borrowed from that account. Uh, we did a five-year loan to ourselves to put the solar on the roof. Um, and and the, you know, this is a permissible kind of transaction in the US that probably would be more difficult in Australia. But it is worth saying that Australians are more into self-managed super funds than we are. I mean, we have you know, a couple of percentage points of investors doing the self-directed stuff. You have 25% of people doing it. But they're doing it for the wrong things. They're not doing it around local investment. It can be done, but we need different kinds of advisors out there that are helping people structure how they work with these rules in a cost-effective way. Another thing that could be done at the municipal government level. And I'll give you an example that underscores that this is not just done by rich people. My colleague, Gilbert Ruchkus, not a rich man, who runs the village well in Melbourne, he recently tapped into his self-managed super fund uh, to build a conference center in the two floors underneath where he, his, he and his wife live in Melbourne. You know, great, great investment. It can be done, but we have to demystify this for people. Number eight, spreading new ownership models. People sometimes think that when you talk about local ownership and you talk about local investment, you are talking about different topics. But actually, we're talking about identical topics. You cannot have local investment without local ownership. And so new models of local ownership are critical to being able to open up opportunities for people to invest locally. I have this picture here. This picture is of a cheese head. A cheese head is a rabid fan of the Green Bay Packers. The Green Bay Packers is the only team in the National Football League in the United States that is not owned by a single obnoxious individual. It is owned by the community. And because it's owned by the community, there will never be Baltimore Packers. There will never be uh, a football team that deserts the community. It's a tremendous wealth asset. So that's community ownership, but we have social enterprises that might be nonprofit. We have co-ops, worker, consumer, producer co-ops. We have community land trusts that are about uh, affordable housing. So I think trying to educate would-be entrepreneurs about all of these different options out there is a way of facilitating more local investment. Number nine, this is where it starts to get a little more challenging, creating local investment funds. If you're interested how we thought through this problem in the United States, this is a free handbook uh, that I did called Community Investment Funds, a how-to guide for building local wealth, equity, and justice. Uh, we have 12 case studies in this. So, and we explain why funds are so important. Because local investment is so immature right now, only been around for six years with the JOBS Act, really the people who do it are very committed. They're super committed. And they spend 
a fair amount of time looking at options, doing due diligence, thinking about what they're going to invest in and then managing their investments. Most of us don't have this kind of time. That's why we hire fund managers to oversee our investment portfolios. A well-run fund does a couple of things that are great because things, businesses are professionally evaluated and selected, the investments are managed over time, you have diversification of the risk so that if you lose one, uh, one company, the other ones will compensate for it, and it also provides some degree of liquidity. So if you need to sell some of your securities, there's a way to get your money out. So some examples of local investment funds in the United States. Boston Impact Fund focuses on African American businesses in distressed communities in Boston. The Good Works Evergreen Fund focuses on legacy businesses where the owner wants to retire and the business probably will go out of business and a main street will take a big hit. So instead, Good, Weeks, Good Works Evergreen helps these businesses find new local investors to keep the businesses alive. The East Bay Permanent Real Estate Cooperative is like a community land trust on steroids that is helping to provide affordable housing to low-income residents in <coughs> Oakland. Pioneer Valley Grows is a local food investment fund in western Massachusetts. And coming to a theater near you, uh, NC3, National Coalition for Community Capital, uh, an organization I work closely with, uh, we have a new design of fund, uh, which is a real estate fund. So under our investment company law, a real estate company that puts 60% or more of its money into real estate is not considered an investment fund. Uh, so I'm not, I'm not saying that this is available in Australia, but one needs to look carefully at what the exemptions are and how one can play with them. And to inspire you just a little bit further, Nova Scotia in 1998 passed a law that enabled neighborhoods to create their own pension funds and gave people a 35% tax credit as an inducement for putting money into the funds. Nova Scotia now has 80 of these funds and uh, this one, FarmWorks, put, specializes in small farms and local food businesses. But if the United States had as many funds as Nova Scotia did per capita, we would have 21,000 of these things. In Alberta, they allow co-ops to become investment vehicles. So co-ops become funds effectively and support a range of businesses underneath them. Number 10 issuance of bonds. So unfortunately I have learned that uh, he, you know, here in, in, in uh, your state uh, bond issuance by cities is really difficult. Where I was in Adelaide, much easier to do. So this may be something to tweak in state law. But in the United States uh, there's been a lot of innovation here. Like the state of Connecticut decided to be inspired by what Franklin Delano Roosevelt did during World War II, which was to issue war bonds where Americans could buy them for five or ten dollars each and in their own way support the war effort. So in the war against climate, Connecticut Green Bank has issued Green Liberty bonds at a denomination of a thousand dollars and allowing grassroots investors to put money into it. They had a $25 million bond offering about a year ago. It was sold out in 48 hours. There was so much hunger out there for people to buy into this. Number 11, incentivizing participation. This is a conservative Republican lawmaker 
who last year introduced a bill in the Michigan State Legislature, I put a little bug in her ear, but introduced a bill that created a 50% investment tax credit at the state level. Now, there's a ceiling on it of a couple of thousand dollars per person, but still, it's an amazing incentive to get people to start paying attention to local investment. The Michigan Republican Party had an accident at the polls last November, and now the Democrats run the legislature, but now the Democrats have reintroduced the same bill, which demonstrates something wonderful, which is that in the universe of local investment, conservatives and progressives find one thing they agree with, which is they distrust securities lawyers. And, and they find common ground in working on these creative solutions together. Number 12, if these ideas make sense to you, I suggest you put one staff person on duty to make sure that these things happen in a coordinated way. And think of it this way. Is it worth one or $200,000 of municipal investment to unlock tens or hundreds of millions of dollars per year going into local business? I think that the answer to that question is obvious. So where I want to leave you is with this scene from Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. And you may remember in this film that after Indiana had suffered through snakes and spiders and bullets and fire, he comes to a crypt. And the crypt is overseen by this 500-year-old guardian. And he says, Indiana, so you search for the Holy Grail. Before you are 50 goblets. Choose the goblet from which Christ drank and choose wisely. Well, at that point, this guy, the German spy, jumps forward and says, ah, I know which one Christ would have drunk from. It would have been the most ornate. He drinks from it, and he spontaneously combusts. And the guardian says, he chose poorly. I would argue that we are all choosing poorly right now. We're choosing poorly by sending all of our wealth out of our community and expecting great things to happen in our community. It will never happen. There is $41 billion waiting for you if you can get this local investment ecosystem to happen. And if there's any group of people that can do it in Australia, I know it's you. Thank you very much. What's the biggest hurdle in achieving this? Inertia, habits. Uh, what was it? Ambrose Bierce in his Devil's Dictionary defined habit as a shackle for the free. And the habit of putting all our money into things that we think have great returns and expecting it to do wonders in our community, that's what we have to break. But there's lots of other obstacles. There are legal obstacles uh, in terms of forming funds and with the municipal bonds we talked about. There are obstacles about you know, people's attention, how much attention they're gonna put into this. Um, I think because the local investment marketplace is immature, people have, people are naturally going to be a little bit distrustful of it. Uh, and it may be, and I think a lot of people have an experience that, you know, when they start doing this, they're not finding enough options out there to put their money into. And then businesses that are thinking of doing this saying, well, I'm not finding enough investors. So it's a chicken egg problem. But I feel like if a city puts a stake in the ground, a city like Newcastle, and says, we understand that someone has to move us out of this inertia and really systematically organize investors and businesses in the community, I think it really could change pretty quickly. Yeah. 
afternoon. Sorry for being late, first of all. My name's Lisa. Well, we did take attendance. So I, uh, we'll mark you here. <laughs> well, I paid extra attention in the last half. Thanks. <laughs> 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 uh, speaking of which, so I work within the council in our community development and social section. So I work with a lot of our social services and particularly non-profits. Um, of the examples that you gave, could you perhaps direct me maybe to two or three where it shows examples of how to link non-profits, particularly for social services, in with our local businesses, but then also within the community to increase their capital. Yeah, so I'm trying to think of what the best examples would be. Um, what, what, uh, what, I'm not sure this was in your introduction, but I spend about a third of my time teaching at a business school. And my business students all have companies. And they are inter and some are nonprofit, some are for profit, but they're all about mission uh, because that's what our business school specializes in. Um, and I think in lots of spaces, you see mission oriented businesses that are taking advantage of crowdfunding. Uh, the two areas that I would highlight one is food. So uh, probably one out of four crowdfunding dollars is going into food businesses. Many of them are trying to repair food sovereignty issues, food deserts. Um, I, I can't tell you, you know, I mean, most of the companies are probably for profit with a social mission, but there are some nonprofits in there. And the other one is energy, uh, that, that there's just a huge array of companies, both nonprofit and for profit, that are trying to solarize right now. But I think we'll see, you know, I always tell my students don't focus on the organizational form that you choose first, okay? Don't decide whether you're a co op or a nonprofit or a public enterprise, or a private enterprise, or a stock company. Don't decide any of that up front. Just make sure you have a cash flowing business idea. And then figure out what is the capital you need in order to make that successful. And when you answer that question, you're going to learn something about what structure of business makes the most sense. So for a nonprofit, if you decide, well, um, it's really, there's a philanthropic sector out there that I want to tap into. Then the nonprofit design is going gonna, is gonna to be the direction you go in. I think for most people, they see more private investors or uh, just bootstrapping as the way to do what they want to do. But it's not, I guess one other thing that I would point out is that Historically, there's been this big distinction between mission-oriented for-profits and non-profits, and that has all but disappeared. There's companies with mission, and then there's companies with bad impact. So all companies have impact, it just depends whether it's good or bad. I'm just going to respond to your philanthropic question, because I work in that space. Um, so, we don't like to talk about not for profits, we talk about not for loss. We're involved in the social impact investing or in Australia. And our social impact investing is actually more about moving away from DGR registered organisations that philanthropy is actually trapped in in Australia. <laughs> so, moving away from DGR organisations and funding social enterprises, um, funding for purpose organisations that operate not as not-for-profits, but you have the social enterprise edge. And our social impact investments are generating, the one I've done this morning, I've just been trying to record on it, is a commercial laundry. 50% of the people in the laundry will be employed from prison, mental health, whatever background that's creating employment barriers for them. And our three-year return is 8% on the investment, and our 10-year return will be 62 that's impressive. It is, right? So That's like annualised, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So there's, I, I think that my my experience working in philanthropy is that most philanthropists have been clever business people. 
And my, most philanthropists don't want to deal with charitable donations anymore, but want to move into creating um, changes to business as usual, or helping not-for-profits shift into social enterprise frames that create investment returns. Um, but that conversation in Australia is actually really hard to have. And we've had it most recently with the State Treasurer too, around superannuation funds and releasing those funds into um, potential investment opportunities for social and affordable housing. And we're currently working on a model for investment on social and affordable housing that actually cuts government out of the picture so that we don't need to rely on government to fund social and affordable housing in Australia going forward and creating a model that's hopefully replicable around the country. But the biggest barrier in all of this work is, is the law. <laughs> Sounds ridiculous, doesn't it? But it is the Australian taxation system and it's the Australian legislation that's set up around how um, businesses can operate. And so as a result, our philanthropic organisations had to create this incredibly convoluted ecosystem to work around all that legislation. Can I just clarify, is the legal issue that there's a belief that nonprofits that use philanthropic capital to do mission-oriented business are competing unfairly? No, I think the legal issue is that most philanthropic organisations are required to give to organisations that are registered as charitable organisations. Mm -hmm. And um, my experience, particularly working with Indigenous organisations across the country, is that very few of them want their business ideas turned into charitable um, ideas. Right. They want to be actual businesses. Right. As a philanthropic organisation in Australia, we can't donate to them. So we now have set up in our ecosystem to include income tax exemption charity. It's all a bit convoluted and boring, but it's just, you've just got to set up these structures to actually be able to move around the, um, the Australian, and, well, New South Wales state and federal legislation that creates enormous barriers, which kind of, those barriers are created to keep um, not-for-profits, not-for-profits. Right. So I, 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 that, that's terrific work that you're doing. It's so important. And I agree with every word that you said. And there's a little bit of movement in the United States in that direction. But yeah, charitable, charitable giving is still too much of a, you know, donation of gifts rather than creating of self-reliance. And, and that's, that is a problem. I wrote an article for a progressive magazine in the U.S. about 20 years ago, which argued that non, if you want to do social change, nonprofits are the worst way to do it. Um, and, and part of the reason is, at least in the U.S. Con context, nonprofits can't do political advocacy, um, which is like tying a couple of hands behind your back, and. There, you know, yeah, there's limitations on what you can do in business and revenue generation. And then the people that you hire are not necessarily entrepreneurial. So that stands in the way of your creating this successful enterprise. So, yeah, pushing in that direction is really important. Uh, we've got five minutes left, so I'll try to whip around the question. Uh, yeah, I just had a question. You said your first step was around education, and my mind went straight away to educating potential investors in the opportunity, but I wonder to how much education is required for businesses themselves, especially when, and, and then also thinking on both levels where you might have family-owned businesses that have only ever taken on loans or bootstrapped to be sustainable. How, you know, what they're sort of, they've always known to They've always known it that, that way to, to, to be self-sufficient um, and so considering their appetite for taking on investment to grow even more might be quite low just because it's something they haven't been really exposed to before and likewise with the investors who put everything into super and just hope that the market's the super fund is just going to manage their fund. I suspect there's an 80-20 rule there where you know 20% of the potential investors have the appetite for the risk and want to invest in local, but 80% have zero idea at all, uh, come from a culture where that's even something that might even be considered as the work that needs to be done to educate that, as you said, yeah. on both sides. Yeah. I, I, I think that there's an enormous need for businesses to be educated. They do not know about this option. 
In Australia, investment crowdfunding was legalized in 2018. Uh, it's happening at a fraction of the level it's happening in the United States, so very improbable that people will be intimately familiar with the beneficiaries of this. So, uh, and to be, to be a successful investment crowdfunding company, there are a lot of basics you have to get right. You know, you have to have a good sense of your balance sheet and who owns different you know, what is your capital table, and what is your plan for expansion. I mean, you, you don't want to encourage any business that doesn't have those kinds of essentials in place. Um, so, yeah, I think it's, it's but, but here's the thing. What I see in the U.S. is every city has entrepreneurship support services as part of, its, of the Economic Development Department, and no one in those departments knows anything about investment crowdfunding. So you are different. Simon and Thomas know quite a bit, especially today. Um, and I feel like there's ways we can build on that. Crash course. Yeah, thanks, Michael. Uh, I'm Rick Walters. I work for uh, AwareSuit, which is the third largest suit fund in Australia. Um, are you getting, and do you feel like, Traveling around Australia, you're, you're, that, that, that there are people getting into the gear of the regulators, the reformers around super. There's a reform review going on at the moment by the federal government around super, the purpose of super, um, because I think to the legal point of view, there's so many blockers within the super sort of regulations, which are meant to protect us and our retirements, but they stop these kind of things happening. I don't, I don't have my super in my way super. I wish I could as an employee. I have a self managed super fund for the exact reasons that you put up. Um, but I haven't invested a lot of money yet. I'm waiting for the right investments. But um, do you feel that there is movement around reform in Australia from talking to people? So I haven't gotten that sense. But, but, but I also have not talked with the people that are front and center there. What I will say is that, so earlier I identified registered investment advisors as an enemy of local investment. Prior to that, the biggest obstacle was the securities regulators because they are op operating out of completely obsolete scripts about what protects the public and what doesn't. It really is what protects exclusive investing in public corporations at this point. Um, I was really surprised to see how bad the first drafts of crowdfunding reform were in Australia, which is why it didn't happen until 2018, because the first, I, I don't, the first version, it was not clear that it, it, it actually seemed like it probably would increase the cost to businesses that wanted to do crowdfunding and a very small minority of businesses could actually qualify for it. So they went back to the drawing board and did something that's better. Um, but doing something on crowdfunding does nothing about resale and exchanges, does nothing about funds, it does nothing about the superannuation funds. We have the same problem in the United States. So I, I can't say I know the secret sauce for reform. Except one thing, except one thing. It is critical to maintain multipartisan appeal. So I work with conservatives and progressives equally, as in the case of Michigan, and I feel like if we can just keep doing that, we'll make progress. Um, just in terms of the, uh, I would say that the rates of financial literacy in Australia are quite low um, and the level required to sort of invest wisely is um, even lower. And most people would have their super, just parked in an industry super fund and they don't really have much say, if any, um, over where that money gets spent. Um, and the regulations and um, compliance requirements for a self-managed super fund are probably too onerous, I think, for the average person. Um, so on that point, have you got any examples where there's been um, success for this kind of global investment with like micro-investing? 
where the, the risk is much, much smaller and probably more accessible for people. Um, well, I guess I, I hear two questions in there. So one question is, you know, yeah, micro-investing, I think a lot of people who uh, are doing this really do see it as very micro. They're working with companies that are quite small or they're, or they're just working with their neighbors. Um, and and that, that is definitely at the micro level. But um, where I thought you were going with it, and I'm gonna go anyway, is uh, thinking about how to organize people together, organizing people to overcome these challenges of the superannuation rules. And so in the United States, we created an organization a couple years ago called The Next Egg, which is all about self-directed IRAs and solo 401k. So we have about 500 people who are part of this sort of community where people raise questions and they work together and we have attorneys who chime in periodically. So we help people through the legal thicket at a very low cost. And I feel like that's kind of what's essential here and missing from the picture. I mean, I, I see in almost all dimensions of securities laws really easy to do answers that are made complicated because it helps keep my brethren in the legal profession, help keeps their incomes high. Th th that has to end. I'll, I'll wrap it up here. I know there's probably dozens of questions left to um, please uh, join me in thanking. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.